This is your other brother's podcast. Welcome, friends, to your other brother's podcast, navigating faith, homosexuality, and masculinity together. I'm your host, Tom, and we're back. And here we are. Let me introduce y'all to who's here. We got a semi-regular contributor now, who I'm very grateful for. His name is Ryan. What's up, Ryan? Hey, everyone. And joining us also becoming a semi-regular, now multiple episodes under your belt, is our good friend Dean. What's up, Dean? Hey, guys. What's good to up? see y'all. It's good to be here, y'all. This is episode 40. What? Whoa. Wait. Moses did 40 things, right? I'm trying to make 40 <laughs> an, significant. An episode for every day and night that Jesus spent there being we go. tempted in the desert. There we go. It's a very biblical number. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's a way better analogy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'll go with that instead. Yes. Episode 40, y'all. And we're talking about change today for a lot of reasons. And we're going to dive into those in a second. But y'all, first of all, we are here currently. T- Dean, do you want to tell us where, where we physically are right now? <laughs> tell us where we are. Guys, we're in the closet. We are in the closet. Uh, n- no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Which is in, in itself a comment. Yeah. Yeah, we are broadcasting, recording, suffering. It's a little hot, but we are in a closet right now. But it's comfortable. It's cozy, I would say. Maybe not comfortable. It's cozy? definitely cozy. I mean, we're like two inches away from each other, which is two inches away from the wall. We're extremely wrapped in tight here. Um, but yeah, we're actually in a closet in a amazing house. And we are on a retreat right now. We've done, this is already mm-hmm. our fourth one of these. Dean, you've been to three of them. Three of them, yeah. I've been to four. And but this is my first Ryan, one. Ryan, this is your first this one. Yeah, great. yeah. So a bunch mm-hmm. of the authors, we've kind of established this tradition every summer, um, it's been amazing. Like last four years, we've gone on these little retreats. We've done multiple mm-hmm. podcast episodes from these things the last couple of years. Uh, I think last summer we had how many, like seven or eight of us. That's Dean, that was your first better. podcast. I think. That was my first that podcast, was. actually. Good times. Yeah, yeah, so you guys can go back through the archives, listen to Dean's first podcast. That was at our last retreat that we had for the authors. And so we've now done this four times. It's been a great weekend. We've had a fantastic time together. And, and it's cool now to get back into the Yobcast, after a little hiatus, a little rest, a little sabbatical, whatever you want to call it. I also get, this is like a pet peeve of mine, we can analyze this. Do you guys get annoyed? I don't know how often you listen to podcasts or how many podcasts you listen to, but I always get annoyed when podcasts say, this is season four or season two, unless it's like a defined thing like serial, where it's a completely different story Mm -hmm. or a completely different storyline. Like if it's just like three bros in a closet talking about gay things and faith things and masculinity things, like, there's been no, like, obvious separation, you know? But a lot of times podcasts will say this is now season two or season three, and it's just the same show. It, nothing's changed. It's the same. Also, if this was season two, that means season one had 39. Season episodes. one was a long season. <laughs> it's yeah. a long, yeah. long, long we, season. Um, yeah, the Yogcast, when we pretty much started, we started out doing monthly episodes, and then we reached a good enough, high enough level of support on Patreon where we're like, I think we can afford to put in the time to do two. And a lot of work still, but two episodes a month. And we've been pretty consistent. I really can't remember a time. Like, there might have been one time where we missed one week, I think. For the most part, though, it's been like two a month for the last year, year and a half. Um, We've been pretty solid without a break. So I was kind of grateful for the break when it happened. And then, but honestly, I found myself the last couple weeks saying, I miss saying, welcome, friends. I miss gathering around a microphone in awkward, hot places with my friends and recording these things and so thank you guys for joining me for whatever this is season two or episode 40 or just the same old same old with a slight twist a slight modification well okay my opinion on the season break thing is (laughs) you know it's kind of like borrowing this antiquated terminology or ideas about formatting from television Mm. that you don't necessarily need for a podcast but i think it could make a lot of sense if there's a big shift in right. in how what what's in the podcast and how it works. Sure. 
I personally like the way British television does it. They use series. Mm-hmm. So like serieses, serieses, <laughs> serieses. Uh, like I watch Doctor Who, and so it's not season six, season seven. It's series seven, series eight, series nine. And so I personally like that idea, actually, of calling it a series. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, it's a new series of the Yobcast. There we go. Yeah. I can get behind that. Yeah. And the next series, Yobcast, the next series. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a different show. It's gonna be very similar as as well. I mean, I don't think it's gonna be super different, but it is a new era. It's a new season. It's a new look and feel. I guess a new sound. We still don't have the look figured out yet. It's not a video podcast just yet. <laughs> Nobody's Someday. here for the look. Don't no. worry about it. <laughs> That's kind of the reason why we were drawn to the podcast <laughs> medium. Yeah. Amen. Um, so yeah, if you've enjoyed thirty nine episodes of the Opcast, we hear from plenty of people who have listened to every episode or have binged like a. 10 or 15 or 20 episodes like in a couple days like god bless you all um i hope you'll yeah continue listening and listening to us and contributing to this dynamic i would love this show to be more of a two-way street and to hear from more of you and stay tuned to the end of this episode you'll get to hear a way that you can contribute even more than already done so stay tuned for that Um, but today we are talking about change and change is something that is significant for everybody everybody experiences change nobody is immune to the winds of change. And so we're going to be talking about just change in life, change in relationships, change in spiritual states, change in dynamics and how you live about your life. So we're going to dive into our changes personally, collectively, and have a great episode getting back into the into the flow again. I appreciate all of you guys who have stood by us and support your other brothers who have been waiting patiently for a new episode. Um, the plan from here on out is to get back on a regular rhythm. So I'm excited to to come back with more episodes weekly, or not, no, not weekly, heavens, what am I saying? Oh my gosh, that would be (laughs) whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to stick with uh, bi-weekly slash bi-monthly episodes of the Yobcast. Uh, No comment. (laughs) Or semi-monthly episodes of the podcast. And so, yeah, thank you guys for your patience and support, as always. Um, What I wanted to do, though, starting off this podcast, because we are at the retreat, we're on our last full day as we record this, we've had... How many days have we had together? Two and a half. Two and a half, three days together. We added a day this year, which has been fantastic, because normally we'd be home right now. We'd have driven away and cried and left each other and been sad for the next three months. But now we get this whole extra day to delay the inevitable. (laughs) So, right? (laughs) That sounds like a good idea. Ryan, I'm just letting you know what's coming. This is all that's... Oh, no, I wouldn't yeah. be a good friend uh-huh. if I didn't let you know that the sadness, it's gonna the desperation be a, It's going to be a big crash. <laughs> mm-hmm. Big crash, big crash. But I wanted to know, y'all, what are some of your highlights? Because, Dean, you've done a few of these now. Ryan, this is your first retreat you've had with us. And, um, yeah, just some standout moments from our, our weekend together. What, did, what stands out to y'all? Um, I think <laughs> probably a big highlight for me was uh, we played Twister last night. <laughs> we had... <laughs> Uh, we had we many did. rounds of Twister. We had some one-on-one, uh, one-on-one competition. We had a giant six-person mm-hmm. Twister oh, yeah. game. We had a, uh, and then we we ended with a tournament um, mm-hmm. that came out with one one winner. Um, I won the six the six-person Twister game, and I was very surprised about that because I have not seen myself as a big you know Twister athlete. Uh, but I think my favorite moment during Twister was. Um, it was the beginning of a game I was playing. The instructions so far were left foot on yellow, right foot on yellow. <laughs> and um, I, I put my right foot on the yellow spot and immediately fell over. <laughs> <laughs> so if you all know the layout of Twister, like all the colors are in a row. So there's no like, contorting, there's no bending, there's no like reaching over. Like you're literally just standing there. It was a thing. Like I, I watched it happen. And I still don't know how it happened. Yeah. Like I watched you plant a foot and well, then down I had, you went. I, to be fair, I had my legs like crossed over. Like uh-huh. my, like I was not standing like straight. You know, my legs were crossed, but that's still like not no excuse. <laughs> You couldn't stand on your own two feet, really. No, I think I was just overexcited. You were, you, you were, you were confident. You beat five other people in a six-person yeah, Twister yeah, mashup. Yeah, I was and overconfident. Then, that was it. Yeah. That's how I lost the Twister tournament. I'm just amazed you remembered which colors were, because I don't remember <laughs> anything This about is that blazoned game. in my memory for decades yeah. now. <laughs> I'm glad you have a memory and a moment, Ryan, mm-hmm. from this retreat that you can take back with you. It wasn't just a standard, mediocre retreat where yeah. nothing exciting or hilarious happen. Far that's from encouraging. It. That's encouraging. 
What about you, Dean? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I loved it so much. One moment... I will say, Dean, you, once again, you've taken the reins on the food this year, and we've had some fantastic meals. We had grilled okay. cheese mm-hmm. and tomato soup today. Yes, we did. So we had a taco bar last night. We had stir fry the other night. Yeah. We did a cookout. They had a grill here, and we did a cookout with burgers and hot dogs. That was pretty awesome. That's the first cookout we've done. Yeah, we've retreat, never done actually. That. Yeah, we've never. It's probably the most masculine we've been on with yeah. retreats. Like I'm Super out there. Mas- Got a grill. <laughs> flames are going everywhere. Were you wearing an apron at least? I was no. not wearing an apron. Oh, okay. I don't. They didn't have any aprons at this, at oh, this well. place. Um, I think my favorite. Do you know it might have been our trip yesterday? Um, yeah, we took a field trip. We yesterday. took a field trip yesterday and actually got to see someone special. Yes, tell me about the special person that we so, met. the viewers might know him. Listeners. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think the, the listeners will know. Uh, so the intro that we have has a unique voice and not one that is, well, regularly on here, but like not one that has been on the podcast in other ways, except for a few times. He's been on a couple times. times. Yeah. But anyway. He's not a recurring voice. Yeah. Uh, but we went and saw Tom's younger brother, Andy. Also, my best Did. friend, John. Yes. So if you follow Dean's blogs, you know that John equals Andy. Or maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe that's revelations to you. But he's Andy's also the intro outro voice for the podcast, and yeah, just a fantastic guy. And it was so cool yesterday. It was really random because Dean, you, and another guy planned this whole retreat this year, mm-hmm. and so I had no idea what we were doing yesterday. And you, you came downstairs to tell me that we're going to see my brother in his hometown, <laughs> and so then we took a field trip because we're located pretty close to there mm-hmm. on our retreat, and then we hung out with my brother for a few hours, and so it was actually really inspiring and touching for me that my brother that you guys got to hang out but then that all my other brothers who were here because we have 10 of us on this retreat Mm -hmm. they got to meet him for the first time too ryan yourself included Mm -hmm. and so it was really cool like i got to share my brother with everyone and my brother loves your other brothers and he's a brother i consider him a brother of your other brothers too Mm -hmm. He so. was he was super fun, and it was really uh, surreal and trippy to hear like this voice that I know very well from listening to thirty nine podcast uh-huh. episodes. Um, this voice, uh, yeah, just talking like about normal stuff, and I kept hearing him talking about like your address and the, and <laughs> Patreon, how they can get in touch, yeah, yeah how the people can get in touch, yeah, yeah. He has other roles to play in this life, yeah. So it was really fun. We went to a park, played frisbee, mm-hmm. and. He brought us an apple pie. That was so did. nice. Mm. It was delicious. And then yeah. he, he took us back to his place, and because we had been outside for so long, he brought, bought us water bottles, and we hung out there. But, yeah, yeah. I think that, that might have been my favorite. Not just, I mean, I always love seeing Andy and hanging out with him, but I think it was also, like Tom said, it was just very cool to kind of introduce him to the brothers and introduce the brothers to him and just kind of unite these, what sometimes feels like two separate worlds, mm-hmm. I think. For me, it does. I'm sure for you Tom as well it just kind of feels like you have a biological family and then you have all these other guys that you would consider your brothers and then yeah. being able to kind of combine that together um, yeah it was a lot of fun I uh, had a good time with Andy shout out to Andy shouts <laughs> Andy you're great um, you're awesome Andy slash John Andy John John Andy um, for me yeah that was definitely right up there with my favorite moments but honestly yeah one of my favorite moments was our first night together because going into this retreat I don't know how y'all felt but I wouldn't say I was anxious about this retreat because I've definitely been looking forward to this weekend for a really long time I always do every summer it's just like a highlight of my year getting to hang out with everybody and just be carefree and to live in this like ridiculous house for a few days and and we've always had great houses and great views and great nature. And so I was definitely excited to come. But there was a little bit of, yeah, again, I wouldn't call it anx- anxiety, but maybe just like questioning curiosity. Like what would the vibe be? What would the dynamic be? Because, yeah, we have a lot of newer faces, Ryan included, newer faces here this year. A lot of mainstays that have attended these things in the years past not here this year. And so it was just going to be a different feel potentially. And I was like, okay, hopefully, hopefully it goes well. And then... The first night, you know, we we played this game where everyone writes down two facts about themselves that supposedly no one else knows. That's the goal. It's like, write down two facts about yourself, throw it in a hat, and then we'll go around in a circle and, like, pull the the items out of a hat and then try to figure out, okay, who does this belong to? Who does this belong to? And, you know, there are some, like, generic ones. Like, I had a best friend named Alex in high school. And then we had other ones. (laughs) My favorite (laughs) one. My favorite one was the bowl of milk. Yeah, someone had, when they were a kid, 
they put a bowl of milk in the closet and called it their pet. <laughs> Wanted it to be their pet. <laughs> and yeah, we won't name names who it was, but it was so funny. There was so much laughter, like someone else... Well, Dean, you said you're allergic to something that I had no idea one could be allergic to. I'm allergic to Pepto Bismol. Allergic to Pepto Bismol. I had no idea. I learned that about you. Um, and then I put in the classic story. My family knows it well, but I had a bunny named Thumper or Peter Cottontail. It had like a double identity. We didn't know what to call it. Um, we kept it outside. It was given as a gift to us from our neighbor. And we kept it outside, and it would get really excited. It would, like, thump its leg against the floor when it saw us, and it, we would feed it carrots and vegetables and stuff. And, and it had a little hut, like, inside its cage with, like, hay so it could keep warm during the winter. And so it survived. I know it survived at least one winter, because then I remember another winter coming around, and all of a sudden we catch news that Thumper is no longer with us, and my dad just comes in and says that Thumper is dead, essentially. And then we ask, like, well, where is Thumper? <laughs> And he just said, well, we threw it out. We threw it in the gar- in the garbage. And so I revealed the fact yesterday that, yeah, I had a pet rabbit, pet bunny, that was thrown in the garbage after it died. We didn't bury it. We buried our fish. We had, like, multiple fish ceremonies that we buried in the yard, but we didn't bury our dear, beloved rabbit. And somehow we didn't guess that this was Tom's story immediately. <laughs> Yeah, y'all, I was impressed. I was, actually, I was honored that you didn't think my childhood was that troubled to think that it's well, surely not Tom. It's got to be seven other people before it's Tom. Well, no, we knew your childhood was that troubled. We just <laughs> thought we knew all the trouble and trauma. So I've been repressing that one for a while now. I'm glad I got to share it, though. Now I'm sharing it with our hundreds of listeners who are now listening to this on our 40th episode back. So thank you guys for being there in my time of need. R.I.P. R.I.P. Thumper. R.I.P. Thumper. <laughs> If you would like to send Tom a replacement pet rabbit, <laughs> no, please, please, <don't. laughs> please do not. I, that is one gift I would not accept in our PO box. Sorry. Sorry, no. <laughs> so, y'all, yeah, it's been a great retreat. I'm going to be sad when I see you guys leave. Um, yeah, especially since it's been a great time lately because I've gotten to see you guys a couple times the last few weeks. We're actually just fresh off of what they call the Revoice Conference. Have y'all heard of Revoice? Revoice. This is Revoice. Yeah, exactly. The Revoice Conference, which if you read our blog, yourotherbrothers.com, you'll see that we blogged about it. We had actually seven authors, seven of our authors there, and we got to have a fantastic time together alongside 400 plus of our now dearest friends. No, I didn't get to meet half of them. A third. Um, I met like, what, 10 people maybe? I don't know. But uh, yeah, we, we got to go to Revoice in St. Louis where it was a gathering for what they call, what the phrase they like to use now is sexual minorities. How do you feel about sexual minorities? I kind of like it. I think it's I feel like it's less supercharged than if someone just said LGBT Christians or gay Christians or I don't know. Sexual minorities, it's like this new thing I hadn't heard of until this conference. So I'm, I'm going with it for now. I'm yeah. just... Yeah, mm-hmm. I I think it's broader because yeah, a little broader. They were including LGBTQ slash SSA Christians, and that's just a that's lot. A lot of that's, that's a lot of letters. That's a lot of just everything. And so mm-hmm. I think just saying sexual minorities. I think also they took influence from Mark Gerhouse because he has a book okay. out now called uh, "Listening to Sexual Minorities." Yeah. Um, so I think that is a new phrase coming out, which I like it. I think it's appropriate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun. We had about 20 or so of our yobbers there, our supporters, and so it was a great little time to hang out with them, connect with all these other people from all over the world. I think six countries were represented, most of the states were represented, and so it was a really cool centralizing, um, just, yeah, unification of all these different denominations and peoples from all over the world who are committed to a traditional biblical sexual ethic and want to worship God and in their convictions and find community in, in so doing. And so it was really great to uh, to unite with all of them, to see you guys again. And if you guys want to read about our experience, you can go to yourotherbrothers.com slash blog and look. We'll have a link in our, in our notes for that post. But we had a great conversation about the conference, our experiences there, our highs and lows. And, and uh, yeah, it was just a great, great time. Looking forward to seeing where that goes in the future. Yeah. So y'all, 
Yes. <laughs> okay, I was waiting for some kind of response. <laughs> Y'all, it's been so we've had this little uh, this little hiatus between episode thirty nine and episode forty. How many people do you think left us iTunes reviews in this in this little break, in this yabbatical that we just experienced? What do you uh, think? How many? Uh, and don't remember your your goal is to make this answer extremely climactic, where it's like, whoa, no way. So, so I shouldn't go with my. So first what's thought. your? What's, <laughs> So how many people do you think left an iTunes review in, in our absence? Hmm. Was it zero? It wasn't zero, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to say negative one. It someone wasn't negative back, one either. Someone went back and deleted Yo, theirs. Would you believe that not negative one, not zero, not one, <gasps> not two, not three, Whoa. four, Whoa. five, oh my four, gosh. four, six... But seven numbers go that high left us an iTunes review. I was astounded. I checked because I haven't. I don't check iTunes all the time. Contrary to what you might think of me, I don't check the the ratings and the reviews every single day. So it's been a while, and I checked it the other day, and I was like, wait a minute. I like I was trying to remember the number, the total number, when last we were here in the Yomcast studio, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> And um, yeah, much to my delight, seven people left us an iTunes review in our absence. And it's been cool, too, to hear from even people at Revoice and emails that we've gotten still over the last month or so, and people who are still discovering the podcast for the first time. Like, even though this thing has been going for a couple years now, people are still discovering it for the first time. I talked to a lot of people at Revoice, meeting people for the first time, telling them about this thing called Your Other Brothers and this podcast that I do. And, um, and so people are hearing it for the first time and feeling the response to support us and leave us a rating review. And so I've been super appreciative of all these new people who are just now like binging it and going to work and listening to it while at work or on the way home or wherever you, wherever you listen to podcasts. So I was super honored and humbled to see seven people. And so I just wanted to read these reviews, give these people shout outs because they support us. This is from a person named DeAngelito. DeAngelito. Shout out to DeAngelito. This podcast is top-notch. It sheds light on important topics that Christian men with SSA think about but rarely have an outlet to discuss. It provides a voice that is seldom heard in today's culture that men with SSA can abide by Christian principles and still have happy, fulfilling lives. I am planning to start listening to some of the episodes with my wife to help generate conversation and understanding regarding SSA. Thank you for the podcast. Keep it up. Thanks so much, D'Angelito. That's awesome. Thank you, D'Angelito. And then, Dean, you want to keep this train rolling? All right. This one is from Knifel. <laughs> Wait, can you recite that again? <laughs> Knifel. C-K-N-O-E-P-F-L-E. Perfect. Shout out to Knifel. Knifel. Thank you. So, here we go. I first heard about Your Other Brothers when Tom was featured in Richard Padilla's 4Ts podcast, and I honestly feel like I've struck gold. I've scoured the internet for resources, writers, and speakers who focus on homosexuality slash SSA and the church in a biblical way. But I've lately had a difficult time hearing relatable anecdotes from those who struggle as similar to mine. Coming to this podcast, I've been pleasantly surprised by the depth of transparency and candidness I hear from the speakers. As someone who has a hard time communing with other men, especially those who are SSA, it is uplifting to have this show as something I can come to on a regular basis. Thanks for the encouragement, and I look forward to hearing more from Yab. P.S. Where are the Enneagram 9s? Is it just me, or have they gone missing? Uh, excuse me, I'm a 9, so hello. <laughs> yeah, I was a little confused by that, because we've actually had 9s fairly featured on this show. I mean, yes, it's very 4 heavy, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, Ryan, you've been on this show, we've had a couple of 9s. I guess, I guess like we don't show. mention it a lot, because it feels mm -hmm. a little obnoxious to mention the Enneagram right. every 30 seconds. If we did the intro at the beginning, I'm Ryan, 9. <laughs> Ryan, comma, 9. <laughs> Healthy. <laughs> Nine Healthy with a one wing, but I have two tendencies and four tendencies. That's so. right, that's right, you do. Don't box me in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do have nines on the show, so I hope you enjoy the nine-age Kapififl. Kapififl. Yeah, thank you for reviewing our show earlier Thanks. this year. Thanks, yeah. And please message us with how to pronounce Kapifl. Yeah, yeah, correctly. that might be helpful. Shoot us an email anytime. Um, here's another one from Joel David. Um, he says, I'm so thankful for this age in which a community has been knit together by technology. If it weren't for Yob and other similar networks, I'd have so little understanding of my own experience. There have been so many times while listening to the Yobcast that I've thought, wow, me too. I've been binging the Yobcast for several days now, and it's helped me understand my relationships, my masculinity, and how I can relate to a holy God. 
Tom and other guests are by no means perfect examples of how to address the intersection of faith, sexuality, and masculinity. You may disagree on certain stances Yob authors have, I know I do, but they're simply men who are willing to share their stories with us, which is incredibly courageous. SSA and non-SSA people can learn so much from listening to these men who have decided to be generous with us. Thanks to Tom and all the others who have put in the hard work to make this happen. Please know that your stories make an impact and are sacred. So many things from your stories resonate with me. Thank you for being vulnerable, sharing your longings and desires, hurts and healing stories, your wonderings, and so much more with us. And then he closed his review by saying, hashtag Yob Fashion. So he's clearly a big fan mm. of hashtag Yob Fashion. I didn't see hashtag Yob Sports, so I'm just going to assume that he's a fan of Yob Sports as well. <laughs> sure. If he's a fan of Yob, uh, Yob Fashion. Okay, so this uh, review is from one called Kit Tufer. Uh, Kit Tufer? Kit Tufer. Oh, no. Kit Tufer. Kit Tufer. Kit Tufer. Yes, the subject line is grateful for your bravery. And it reads, as an SSA man, a lot of what I hear from your podcasts rings true to my own story. I think it is such a good thing that you offer men who struggle with unwanted same-sex attractions a community of like-minded brothers who seek the will of God in their lives. A safe space to be authentic about the realities of life from our perspective a judgment-free zone, and a healthy alternative to turning to trash online to medicate when we don't feel accepted by the world. I am a relatively new yobber, and I am currently listening every day to catch up with you on all the episodes you have published so far. I look forward to that time spent virtually with you. Thank you for doing what you do for guys like me. You are brave beyond words. Thanks, Kit Tufer. Yeah. That's really super encouraging. This one is from Zadam11. Thank you, I wonder if Zadam eats at Zaxby's where they have <sighs> salads. But no milkshakes. But I'm no still... more milkshakes. We took a Zaxby's. This is a side tangent. For everyone that lives in the Southeast, you know what a Zaxby's is. Mm-hmm. It's basically like Chick fil A, but better. Oops. Careful. <laughs> okay, you're going to get another one star <laughs> review like that. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. We're getting to that. Um, but Dang, yeah, Kathy's they, come used to have, they used to have the birthday milkshake, which I actually never got to consume. And I was looking forward to trying that for the first time when we took a Zaxby's trip on this here retreat. And they sadly told us they no longer sell this item. So that's unfortunate. I was so disappointed. Zadam. So, sorry. Zadam, I'm sorry, but your name triggered the need for that one. Anyway. <laughs> I can't wait to read your review. So, here's what Zadam had to say. I subscribed to this podcast a little over a year ago, and am just now getting around to listening. After listening to a few shows, I find myself refreshed by honest and vulnerable topics and discussions that are covered. I am excited to listen to more and learn more about the community here. Thanks, Zadam, and I'm glad you finally got around to listening to it. Yeah, that's super interesting that you subscribed a year ago. I'm a little offended that it took you that long to give us a shot, but... I'm glad you gave us a shot hey, as well. <laughs> better late than never. Take yeah. what we can get. We'll take what we can get. I, absolutely. Beggars can't be choosers. The person who left this chose to type into the name box the following. Nickname, 737469. Hopefully that's not their phone number <laughs> or social security number or yeah. something important. A friend of mine introduced me to Yob a little over a year ago, and I've been listening to this podcast ever since. It's really encouraging to hear stories from people who have similar struggles and experiences as me. Having grown up in the South, I know the isolation that comes from being caught in the middle of the war between an often condemning church culture and a secular culture that says go for it. It seems that a lot of Christians fall away over the issue of homosexuality, especially if they themselves struggle with SSA, and there's no doubt in my mind that isolation plays a role in this. All that to say, Yab is a rare source of community in an ever-dividing world. Yeah, I totally agree, and thanks so much for the review, nickname 737469. Nickname? Thanks, nickname. All of those were five-star reviews, and thank you to everyone who enjoys the show. If you enjoy and support the show and want to give us a five-star review, please do. You can go to iTunes and do that for us. Um, but yeah, we've done this in the past. We haven't, we're not immune to criticism and constructive feedback, and I'm all about analyzing that and having a good time with it. (laughs) And so um, in our seven reviews left, we did receive a one-star review. Um, I think this is our first one-star, because we talked about a two-star review. Remember the two-star review? Mm -hmm. That was the last podcast. Yeah, and so I wanted to read this and just kind of, you know, put it out there. I appreciate the review because it shows that you listen to our show, and that means a lot. Um, But this is from someone called Ohio Republican. 
Which I w- I'm even surprised that we got a, a one star. Like, is it possible to give zero stars on a on a podcast? I think this is why we get one star. <laughs> we got we were at least got one star from the Ohio Republican, and he just says I urge caution. So let's talk about that. So Ohio Republican said. I would urge caution. These guys have been posting things on their site that could hinder those with SSA. Posts raving about gay-themed shows with sexual innuendo and jokes about male anatomy. Posts about cuddling naked with other guys, etc. When concerns are expressed, these guys respond with arrogance and tell you to just leave while blocking people expressing concerns. I question if some of them are even Christians as they are living right on the edge of the gay life instead of getting as far from it as they should. And so my initial thoughts about that, and we can see if you guys have any thoughts too. I'm assuming they're talking about, I mean, we'll just say it. He's talking about gay-themed shows. We have written about the show Queer Eye, um, which we've written about that. It's actually written by someone in ministry, and that post was, I mean, I enjoyed the post a lot. He put a lot of disclaimers in the post, which I appreciated Mm -hmm. from a ministry perspective. Um, But it was mainly a post talking about self-care and like... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Dean, you lo- you watch the show. You love the show as well. Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure about the other concerns, though. Um, posts about cuddling naked with other guys. I don't think we've ever the, not, not advocated for it. I think someone might have written about it from a... And he was very clear about it not being a healthy choice that he made. So yeah, it's not uh, like we were advocating for that. If that's what I'm thinking of, yeah. I was probably referencing something that uh, one of Eugene's, part of his um, uh, guide to cuddling with... Brothers series, mm-hmm. but yeah, I don't think I don't remember him advocating for it because I would have been that would have been a red flag for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he did advocate. He talks about cuddling with other guys and how it can be helpful. He also, but he talked about the dangers of it and what what can happen if you don't do it correctly, if you have the wrong motivations. Yeah, it sounds like um, if if the reviewer was talking about posts about cuddling naked, that doesn't sound familiar for, for me, but that sounds like maybe conflating two different kind of st- strings of blog posts about nudity, which I think is important to talk about and about cuddling, which is also important to talk about. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're kind of, one of the reasons we're here, it's not the only reason, but certainly a significant reason why we're here while we're blogging, while we're podcasting is because we want to talk about the things that we don't see people in the church, especially talking about it. Like, like, yeah, is nudity ever okay? Is cuddling mm-hmm. ever okay? Is it watching Queer Eye ever okay? And these are things that are certainly subject to debate, but we're just sharing our yeah. experience with them. Um, the whole concept of, like, blocking people and turning people away, like, as the editor of Your Other Brothers, um, yeah, I will say we moderate comments because it's fair to say that our website receives hits and a lot of attacks and shots. And we want it to be a safe place for people to share comments respectfully. And so if comments are respectful, if comments um, can disagree and disagree well, those comments stand. And they there have been plenty of comments. You can read through, you know, 200 blog posts of plenty of disagreements over the years. Um, and people, for the most part, actually, it's a very small minority, but for the most part, a vast majority of our commenters comment, if they disagree, they disagree well. And there's no, like, reason to moderate and block and... Um, discourage those people from ever coming back and disagreeing again. But yeah, lately, for whatever reason, I feel like this kind of happens in waves. Like, we have these seasons where everything's going great on the comments, nobody's, like, causing a stink or causing a ruckus, and then all of a sudden we just hit hit a stretch where it's, like, a couple weeks of just really nasty, vitriolic, just comments that aren't open to feedback or a conversation really is the goal. Um, There's just never a conversation that comes out of it. And so, yes, then comments need to be moderated and that's just for the health of the community and so you know i'm sorry if that person was one of them i'm sure he probably was based on that comment but yeah yeah but so Um, it is i know the one thing about that that review that uh bothered me was he goes i don't even know if they're christians Mm. you're talking about one aspect of what we believe Mm. and so for me uh Yes, I'll talk about, like, I, I like the show Queer Eye. I didn't write that blog post, but I made a comment on another post about how I enjoyed it. And I've talked about other things, but, like, to to look at my views on sexuality and say, well, obviously, you might not even be a Christian. You're not even talking about what's actually important to being a Christian, which is the gospel. You're not asking me, what do I believe about Jesus Christ? Mm-hmm. What do I believe about the Trinity? What do, you, what do I believe about what it means to be saved? What it means to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ? You're not asking me any of those theological questions. And so before you make a judgment call based on that, I would encourage you to reach out. I 
I have an email address up on the website. Email me, dean at yourotherbrothers.com. Email me and say, ask me for my principles of faith, and I will gladly send you, along with sports from scriptures, uh, about what I believe. Um, and also, if you want to look at the, uh, another support, look at what James says at the end of the first chapter. He says, unadulterated religion is this, care for widows and orphans. So ask me how I care for widows and orphans around me. I'll ask you the same thing. How do you care for the widows and orphans around you? And that can be the testament of my Christianity, my faith. Mm. It's been helpful to just like re- be like really during times of criticism or blowback to like look around me, to look at the people pouring into me who actually know me on a daily basis, who know the other dimensions of my personality, mm-hmm. certainly of my spirituality, and to be affirmed that they're going to have way more to speak into me than a person without a face typing words on the internet that doesn't know me, mm-hmm. has never exchanged a single conversation with me. Um, and to be able to just rest in that, knowing that like, I'm going to yeah. do my very best, of course, to translate my beliefs and who I think Jesus is and how important and critical and vital he is, not only to me, but to all of us. Um, you know, and that's not going to be perfect. I'm not going to be able to say everything I need to say or express everything I need to express in one fell swoop, but doing my best. And mm-hmm. like, I hope Ohio Republican, you'll, uh, you'll see the other dimensions of us, the more stories you ingest, if you are sticking around, um, but yeah, feel free to email Dean, email me, email any of the authors. I'm sure we could have a fruitful conversation if you're, yeah, if you're down to disagree well, I'm always down to disagree well. And I wanted to give a shout out to, um, this is something I might introduce more and more because we get feedback through um, our iTunes reviews, which is great. We also get plenty of feedback through emails and I don't want to read emails on the air. It's certainly not, I don't want to like tell people's stories on the air, but Sometimes lines that people write are so great, and I just need to say the lines because this one was actually really great. I read this right before I left for our retreat this weekend, and it was really great just to be encouraged in one like dramatic line um, to keep doing what we're doing, to keep this podcast and this community and this ministry going. And it's one of those rare, not uncommon anymore, but it's one of those rare female emails. We get these female emails um, from our beloved female readers and listeners um and she is really great because she's just super encouraging she mentioned that she's not same-sex attracted and that she's actually losing her christianity and that she's you know all these like reasons why she quote-unquote shouldn't like listen to our podcast or be into our podcast or listen along with our community i actually don't know if this was in reference to our podcast or blog or just everything in general but she made a line that said in reference to your other brothers she was like it's a little oasis that cuts through all the shit. So I appreciated that line <laughs> so much. Love it. <laughs> a awesome. little oasis that cuts through all the shit. So thank you to our female email. Thanks, sister. Of the week. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and yeah, if you guys want to reach out, you can shoot us an email, podcast at yourotherbrothers.com. We'd love to hear your feedback for the show, ways to improve it. And again, stay tuned to the end of the show. We'll have more ways to get involved in this endeavor. And if you want to support the show... Um, in other ways, you can go to patreon.com slash your other bros. All the information is there about how to get more involved, not only in the ministry aspect of your other brothers, but the community aspect as well. We have a secret Facebook group for pledging members and a really thriving community that I'm super grateful for. Um, got to see a bunch of those guys at Revoice, and it was really cool to see them fairly recently. Everyone is so wonderful. Everyone is just I'm, great. Yeah, right? I love I love all the yobbers. All the yobbers, yeah. We love our yobbers. Um, so thank you guys for supporting this show. All the information is there on Patreon if you want to support your other brothers on a monthly basis. And as always, before we get into the meat of our episode, we need to tell everyone, including you guys, how this episode is even possible. Because we couldn't do it without change machines. Mm. You know when you go into grocery stores and those little machines of... You like empty your uh, piggy like, banks and those big old mason jars, oh, the pennies yeah. that you've collected for the last 17 years. Mm-hmm. You dump it all in there and you'll get like a buck 48 out of it. And then That's, you can go spend that. I was about to say <laughs> the, the ones that take store. like 30% of everything you put <laughs> in there. I'm glad you brought this up because uh-huh. I have literally like jars and jars full of change at home. And I've been promising myself uh-huh. I'd go to the... Uh, the change machine. I'm not going to say any any product names on the air, <laughs> right? Because this, this is sponsored change. by change machines in general, <laughs> right? Um, but take it to the change machine at the grocery store and and cash it in for an Amazon gift card. Oh yeah, um, if you're lucky. Yeah. 
Which, which no, those don't charge any, like, they uh, you don't get take straight away. Yeah, you can get Amazon gift card okay. uh, for actual value. So thank you, Change Machines. Yeah. Thank you, Change Machines. If you guys collect change, some people do that. I, I don't want to say this on the air because I no I'll just say it I'm a, I'm not I'm not ashamed I will actually for the most part throw my spare change away because I just don't want it <laughs> I'm like what am I gonna do with twelve cents today nothing so I'm getting rid of Look it Look at who's making buku bucks driving <laughs> Lyft and Uber <laughs> No what I will do is if I get spare change like if I'm in a situation where I'm at a coffee shop or a place with a tip jar like it'll just go in there like that's not a big deal. But, like, if I just get random four cents back for something, like, what what am I going to do with that? I don't, I'm not going to designate a change you jar. You could at least, like, throw it on the sidewalk outside for the neighbor kids. <laughs> Here's what I think you should do. Get a jar, uh-huh. put it in your place where you live, uh-huh. and write Patreon on it. There we go. And contribute to your... The Patreon. Contribute to the Patreon. That can be yeah. a pledge to it. Yeah. Or, now that you know about change machines, you can take those four cents yes. to the grocery store and put them in there. True, true, and true. get four cents... From a doll. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that it works work? somehow. <laughs> <laughs> somehow it ch- it makes money out of it. I don't know. Like money that you can actually use. They hand you the edge of a dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Change Machines, for fittingly. It's great how these sponsors really fittingly match up. Like every That's so episode. Amazing. How, how does that work? Thank how you. do you do it? Change, machi- change Machines sponsoring this episode on Change. We are talking about change today. Um, like I said at the beginning of the episode, change is not something that is you know, uncommon to certain people, uncommon to others. Like, change hits everyone. Relational change, spiritual change, emotional change. Um, This is life. Life is lived in seasons and valleys and hills, ebbs and flows and winds and times of humidity and just mugginess. And so there's all kinds of atmospheres and journeys that we all take, and so change is common to all of us. And so I figured today would be a great episode, as this is a very transitional episode in the life of your other brothers in our podcast, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to just talk about the change in our lives. And I thought a fun, maybe not fun, but maybe a fun first question would be, I've thought about this a lot, this whole concept that if your life was a book and let's say it ended today, sorry, but it's over. (laughs) Today's the last page. If you had to draw a line down the middle of your book, the book of your life, like a jagged line, a before and an after, a part one and a part two, what event would be the event or the year or the experience, however you want to define it, but the thing that separates your life into two halves? Is there any kind of one critical dividing moment where there was a change and there was a before this happened and a b- after this happened? Uh, for me, I can actually think of a really clear divide, uh, and that was when I went from thinking I was going to be working as a professional musician, and I actually went into ministry. Um, Because pretty much everything from the age of 12 up was focused on music, 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 being a musician and pursuing that and working. That's like everything I did, every class I ever took and every experience. It was all geared towards being a musician. And then uh, when I was in grad school and I felt God calling me into ministry, as soon as I made that decision... It really was like a jagged break in my life because suddenly everything had a new focus. It was, how do I pursue ministry and what does that look like and what does my relationship with God you know, need to look like now that I am actually following his plan and not pursuing my own plan for my life. And so, yeah, I can look back at that and see a really clear break. Uh, and it's odd that it would just be that focus because... I think at that time I realized my whole life had been focused on my plan for it and I hadn't ever taken the time to really consider what is God's ultimate plan for me and where is he leading me. And so, yeah, I would say that's my my part one is life of a musician. My part two is life of a minister. That's huge. What a shift. What a shift. And yeah. neither of them have that much money involved, so. <laughs> yeah, so it's not like you're going from accounting... <laughs> You know, hot shot to lowly pastor of a church, you know? Like, I went from no money to no money, so. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Well, in terms of, like, the plot of a book, if I were an author, I would choose as that turning point kind of my decision to um, come out to a friend for the first time and um, kind of 
that journey, that transition of being in a lot of self-denial about my sexuality and then, um, and then opening up to admitting it to myself and then opening up to one other person and opening up to more and more people was big. And, and I think, uh, has a lot to do with kind of the core of what it means to be me and my experience, but that's not the change I wanted to talk about. Ooh, um, <laughs> I want to say, um, like the change that happened in my life that has the sharpest divide where it felt so much different before and after is in, um, in 2011, I believe, um, I lost 60 pounds over the course of 18 months. Um, like all up to that point I had, uh, I had always been kind of on the overweight side, some, some, some seasons more so than others, but at the age of 25, um, I sort of realized, okay, if I really want to be fit, um, you know, no one's going to solve this problem for me. If I don't do anything about it, nothing's happening. So it, my life, I changed my lifestyle a lot. I was exercising a lot more, thinking about food a lot more differently. And, um, and just like that shift in, uh, over those 18 months, that change in how I saw myself and, um, and what, what it was like to, uh, occupy my body, I guess is a good way to put it. That was this huge, that honestly, that was a profound difference. Um, and yeah, I had more self-confidence. I had more, um, I even, I even for the first time in my entire life felt like a little bit of an athlete. And that was a huge, that was a huge change. My walk with body image is something I want to, I plan to write more on the blog. So keep, keep your eye out for uh, more posts about that. I will. I will keep an eye out. Thanks for sharing, Ryan. That's awesome. Self-care all the way. I, uh, yeah, I was thinking about this question myself because, you know, I was rolling through all the options for myself too, like moving as a kid or moving out for the first time as an adult or, you know, this event, this event. There's been a lot of critical pivot points and junctures for sure. But really, at the end of the day, the fact that I'm so now so much of my life is your other brothers and putting stories out there, my own stories and, you know, collecting and refining other people's stories and putting them out there. You know, this is my life now. And I couldn't imagine like this was not ever in the trajectory of my life. Like growing up as a scared, isolated little kid who had no idea what his sexuality was and just kind of hid it away for so long without addressing it and considering it. Um, really the changing point, it's fitting that we're here on this retreat, but the changing point for me was finding this community to begin with and searching Christians struggling with homosexuality. It was our very first blog post on Your Other Brothers, and you can read about our about story on our about page, but this whole concept of finding other people like me when I just assumed that I was the only one, which is a laughable thought now, (laughs) seeing like not only the people in this house today, but you know, the people that we met at Revoice and the people that came to our Yabbers retreat a couple months ago and, and all of these dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people that have interacted with us over the last couple of years through the blog and through the podcast, through our video channel, through Patreon, through our social media channels. Like it's been super encouraging and humbling and overwhelming at times to realize that I'm not alone and to realize that other people are realizing that for the first time. And how powerful a notion that is to realize that you're not alone and that there are other people also oriented toward Jesus more than anything, trying to figure out what, how to get through and how to, to navigate this life, especially with other people with them. And so finding, finding this community on the Zanga blogging network that I was a part of, that Dean was a part of, that so many of our authors were a part of back in the day. That was the turning point for me because, man, before that, I just assumed I'm going to be alone and I'm never going to really tell anybody about my sexuality. That's just going to be a secret I take with me to my grave. I'm just going to keep it all to myself. And my life could not be any more opposite that now because now I'm like constantly talking about stories of sexuality and masculinity and connecting with people in coffee shops and grabbing meals with them and talking about our stories and our faith journeys and And that is so, like, again, inconceivable to 20-year-old Tom back in the day when I just assumed that that's something I'm not going to ever address or talk about. And so I'm grateful for that experience, finding the Zanga community. And then out of that, yeah, creating your other brothers with some of my dearest friends and going on these 
little crazy retreat trips every summer and inviting new people into the fold. It's been really just, yeah, an amazing, amazing turn of events. And I'm so grateful for, for that before and after moment. So I think that's a good um, general way to approach the subject of change, talking about these like big pivotal before and afters of our lives. But I'm curious, maybe, and maybe this will align with those decisions and those experiences that we just talked about. Maybe it won't, but talking about also our biggest relational changes that we've experienced, our biggest spiritual changes that we've experienced, um, just as ways to get a little more specific about the kinds of change that we weather as humans, as brothers in this life. And um, yeah, I'm curious, just maybe from an emotional perspective, or you can tie that into a relational perspective too, just like something that was for better or for worse or for both. If there's like two things that stick out as far as like a relationship that changed one for the better, one for the worse. Maybe it was the same relationship. Maybe they were a different relationship. Um, we love relationships here at Your Other Brothers. We like to, to talk about those. Emotional dependency, that's something we like to talk about too. So you could mention some of those changes. But yeah, I'd want to hear what some of the things you guys have experienced and then I'll share share some of mine. I think for me... Uh... The biggest like biggest negative relational change. I mean, it turns out for the better, but like the biggest negative relational change is actually it's a friendship I haven't blogged about yet. Um, I know, so this is a sneak. Wait, peek how many guys. blogs have you written? <laughs> uh, like five. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't blogged about something that is shocking. I know. Uh, no, but this was a uh, a friend of mine. Um, I'll call him Roman. Oh um, yeah. And so I knew Roman in high school, and when I started college, um, I ended up becoming closer with him after I went away to college. Uh, he used to get on AOL Instant Messenger. AIM. AIM. He used to get on AIM, and I would talk to him, and he was a night owl, and so was I. So we actually would talk like every single night for like three hours, two, two three hours, like up to like 3 or 4 a.m. Um, and I ended up becoming super codependent upon him. Like, to the point that, I mean, I would try to dress like him. I only want to listen to the music that he wanted to listen to. Uh, I tried to make the same jokes as him. I wanted to, like... It, it was unhealthy, completely unhealthy. And so I fell into codependency with him, and it wasn't... It was for a few... It lasted for a few years before um, it finally ended because there just had to be a break, um like his family even stepped in and just like Dean you you have to you have to figure out where your priorities are because you're this is unhealthy and so uh that relationship that friendship ended up actually basically dying um mm-hmm. and so I, I I was messed up over that because obviously I was codependent and so I wasn't ready to let go of him yet and I had no choice so he was kind of ripped away and so I wrestled with that and so that friendship unfortunately has never really returned I mean that was oh gosh a decade ago or more that that relationship fell apart and I I'm better now he he recovered pretty quickly because he wasn't the one who was codependent but for me I wrestled for years. Isn't that annoying that the one that's not codependent, they get off easy? They get to just live their life as usual? I know. It's just... <laughs> that's so unfair. They should have to get to suffer too. Oh, man. Just kidding. Just, just but like yeah, that. I mean, I, I spent years, like, I... He was okay, and I just... But I wasn't. And so, to, even to the point now that... I mean, I haven't seen him in I don't know how many years. And he and I have chatted a few times, very rarely, because I don't ever try to contact him initially. He'll... he'll text me or message me out of the blue about something random or something like that and we were actually going to meet up uh, and just hang out for an hour or two a couple of months ago and it ended up falling through but uh, that just relationship is well I'll I know that I'll never really be as close to him uh, or have anything like that so that was a relationship that definitely had a a major change um for the worse Mm -hmm. um mostly because of my own doing do you think, Dean, that, like, it's so obvious now, looking back, that you were codependent or had emotional dependency issues, but do you think learning, do you think you've learned from something like that to where it's now easier, maybe not, maybe not necessarily easy, but is it easier for you to realize that maybe you're starting to experience unhealthy tendencies towards certain relationships today? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't always do it on the uptake, but I, it got a lot faster, like, I... 
because uh, I know to look out for. I know I'm, uh, my personality type is just more to be kind of dependent upon someone else and to latch on to them. And so I've learned a lot about that. And that experience taught me a whole a whole lot like that's what that really was. And so a few years later, I started getting codependent on another friend and I was able to catch myself early enough to kind of cut that off and and everything. And there's been other times with other friendships where I've kind of realized, oh, oh crap, I think I'm feeling codependent. I think there was one recently that I even texted you about a few years ago and I was like, I think I'm getting codependent upon this person and mm. I'm, I'm really worried about that and uh, everything. So I did learn a lot. It ended up, like I said, it ended up teaching me a lot, but it definitely was a change for the worse because I do... I know that if I hadn't done that, he Roman would have been a loyal friend that would still be sticking by me today, and I messed that up. And so I know I've lost any sort of closeness we could ever have because of the decisions and choices I made. Well, I look forward to reading this blog at some point. I feel like I thought I'd read everything there was to read about every relationship in your life, but apparently not. No, there, <laughs> there are other secrets we'll unearth. There are a few more, but yeah, Roman is one that I need. I've written, I think I've written like a few drafts and I just deleted them because I didn't like where they were going, mm. but I, I'll have to revisit that. Nice. Look forward to that. Mm -hmm. I did have one that was actually better though, oh, uh, but this one has nice. been, this one I'm not going to recap a lot. It's my relationship with John slash Andy, which I did blog Shout about. out to Andy. Woo! Again. <laughs> this episode's all about you. Uh, this one I blogged about. It was it was uh, actually right when Girl the Brothers started, and I uh, we, our relationship ended up changing for the better. Uh, but that was also because again I was making mistakes. I feel like most of my life revolves around me making mistakes. But mm, amen. Um, <laughs> yeah, our relationship changed for the better, and yeah, it was just great to see, it was great and fantastic to see. Okay, you know, our relationship did have to change because we were no longer living anywhere near each other. We were in two, we were in different points of life, um, and we had both grown and changed. And I wasn't wanting that to change, and I was refusing to allow it. And that's when I ran into that whole mess. And if you go back and read those posts, you can read about, you know, me freaking out because I saw someone that looked like him, and then me ignoring him, and then finally the kind of the conversation where we came back and decided, okay, you know, we may not what we don't know what our relationship is going to look like for the rest of our lives, but we can figure out, okay, how can we be friends now? And we've actually been able to then grow closer mm -hmm. in a more mature way that's a little bit more equal, I would say. Um, and so we, you know, I would still consider him one of my best friends, and we got to hang out this past weekend. And, uh, yeah, I think it was just fantastic to be able to see him, just be able to see that change for the better, yeah. to see a good change yeah. in a relationship. I'm glad y'all worked it out. That would be devastating if there's now a wedge between my brother and one of my better friends that I've ever had. Yeah, that'd be that'd be tragic. That'd be awkward. We'll put yeah, we'll put links to all of Dean's posts. The John, you wanna call them like the all John them? Chronicles? <laughs> yeah. You all promise? Like eight hundred <laughs> chapters of all of Dean's stories. Yeah, we'll put those in the links to this episode as well. So if you're curious, you want to dive more into this this uh, dynamic with my brother. Dean's friend like yeah it's a cool story I'm glad it's working out and mm -hmm. it was fun to yeah hang out this weekend that was a fun fun moment what about you Ryan what are some mm. relational changes in your life well the relationships that I thought about to talk about they actually have a lot of commonalities with the stories Dean just told um you know so I have a friend John who um who I who I went through a sort of a similar process with um, in Dean's story about Ro Ro Roman. Roman. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think it was as dramatic necessarily, um, as, as that story. And also I don't, I'm not sure I really want to use the phrase emotional dependency for that situation. Um, I will definitely say like there was, I was very emotionally attached to John, um, and, and sort of that, those, that tension and those problems sort of came to a head eventually and that relationship sort of collapsed and, and, um, and I wrote a blog post about it where I kind of chose my words very carefully. So we'll put a link to that in, uh, in the notes here, but I feel like that was not, I don't want to call it a bad change either. Um, I think that that was a very hard change for me, that transition from, 
uh, all of this space in my life being occupied by this one relationship and then this one friendship and then have and then having nothing after that um and i and i will say like big picture i've in the past year or so i've seen um just new life in the space that that relationship used to occupy and that's been i've been i think that's good i've been really thankful for that and excited about that in terms of um a change that's been good over the course of the past you know, 10, 12 years. Um, I just love the changes that I've seen happening in my relationship with my friend Micah. He's a very close friend of mine. Shout out to you, Micah, if you're listening. Um, he normally lives in um, in Japan, and so, um, so I don't get to see him that often. But I consider him one of my really... Um, I consider that sort of a golden friendship is the, is the phrase I use in my head, just um, has been around for a long time, is very valuable for me, has been refined a lot. Um, and that relationship really started out as, um, as a relationship that was threatened uh, in different seasons with that sort of emotional attachment, emotional dependency, and, um, and God's grown grown me and grown Micah and grown that relationship into something that I feel like is um, beyond a lot of that. Like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and claim that, oh, now I can't screw up in this relationship because I definitely can. But um, but I feel so much more secure in that friendship. I feel much more, um, I feel like that's a, a relationship that really brings me a lot of strength versus, um, versus, relationships where I might fall into emotional dependency or emotional, um, just an unhealthy place. Those relationships tend to, um, tend to make me feel weaker, um, while putting up the illusion that I need that friendship for strength, but that's not how I feel about Micah. And so just looking at the, over the course of the past decade, the, the ways, um, God has sort of brought us to, to a very good place, um, is, kind of my favorite story of relational change. Mm. So for me, yeah, I've been like going through all, as y'all are talking, I'm like, I'm listening, but I'm also zoning out and like going to like all these dark places of all these friendships that have fallen apart or experienced emotional dependency or enmeshment or whatever clinical term you want to put on it. The one that always comes to mind as like the biggest change. I mean, really, if I wanted to just be concise, I could say the biggest change for the better and for the worse in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, it ended in the worst part. But I would say change for the better was realizing that I can connect with men in general and not just men who are SSA or gay identifying or whatever terminology they want to use. Because um, for a couple of years, it was great to be able to blog and to make connections online and go to conferences and meet people who would become my closest friends. And um, and I was it was a helpful first step of going straight out of isolation Instead of just, like, going straight out of isolation for, you know, the better part of middle school, high school, and college, um, and then expecting to connect with everybody, you know, I could find my people first and connect with other believers who also experience same-sex attraction and develop friendships with them and kind of build what had been deteriorated for years and years and years, this whole social dynamic of just connecting with people of my, of my same sex. And so... It was very helpful to be able to do that, but then going on a, um, trying to figure out how to define it. It was, it was a job, it was a temporary job, but it was a ministry job, um, where I got to work in ministry alongside three or four other people for an entire summer in a foreign city that I'd never been to and got to work basically 24 (laughs) seven with these people, um, all summer long in the city doing ministry work and welcoming in churches and youth groups and interacting with um, interacting with the church and interacting with the city. And so my supervisor that summer was a straight man and a couple years younger than me. And I had never had to interact with anybody like him, not in an intentional way where we're expected to pour into each other and be like super connected and check in with each other. And, um, 
and not just because this is normally this would be the type of person I would just avoid in a church. Like there's there'd be no reason for me to connect with this person. So, so I'd say the change for the better was working up the courage to share my story with somebody who doesn't share my my proclivity for the same sex, um, and to be able to share my story, so many elements of my story, not just my sexuality, but just, you know, being bullied or being isolated or feeling like an inferior in the church and not being able to do public speaking all that well and being able to share a lot of pent up insecurities and anxieties with this straight man who would listen to me. And on the one hand, it was his job to do that, to listen to me. But on the other hand, there was genuine interest there. And it was great to experience a connection with with a man that I'd never experienced before in my 20 some years of life to that point. And so that experience alone, that summer alone, gave me the hope that, you know, I'm maybe not as different as I like to think I am. I'm pretty different, but not as different, not as isolated, not as far gone as I think I am. And and actually sharing a lot in common with with men, even if they don't experience homosexuality in any context. And so I was extremely, yeah, it was scary. It was you know, very different. I didn't know what I was doing half the time when I was communicating with him. And like, am I asking for too many hugs or like what, you know, what's the cutoff of physical touch or, or am I sharing too much verbally? Should I be asking more questions about his life? You know, just like all these different things looking back now that I wish I maybe would have done differently, but at the same time I was learning as I went. And so for the better, I definitely learned that I can connect with other men. It doesn't have to just be men of the SSA or gay identifying stripe a sexual minority, if you will. Um, but yeah, for the worst, on the flip side of that, that friendship no longer exists. And so that has been, I mean, I'm, I would say I'm over it now in, in the context that I don't stay up all night thinking about this particular person or the way it could have gone. But I mean, I can't help thinking about this person and just like kind of having this like nostalgic sigh and just wondering, you know, gosh, if we were still friends, what would have, where would that be right now? Where would we be? Where how would it have grown? How would it have shifted? Um, ultimately, it was just, we were kind of a victim of geography and changing seasons and him going one way geographically, me going another way geographically and just entering different seasons of life. And there wasn't really much of a foundation beyond a chaotic summer to maybe hold that friendship together. And I've learned to let go of it. You know, it's not, like I said, it's not something that I hold on to so um, tightly today. But for a while there, when that friendship was falling apart and when it was pretty clearly done, um, it was difficult. That was a hard change to go from. Because for a while, I wondered, like, gosh, is it just hopeless? Like, should I just not connect with other men? Should I just stick with women or stick with other SSA guys? Like, is that just the easier thing to do? Is that the safer thing to do? And, you know, it's still a challenge sometimes. But I think overall, I'm grateful for that relationship because it was one of the, my more meaningful ones to experience and learn through and I'm glad that it happened but relational change is hard losing friends is hard and Mm. I uh yeah my only goal yeah as a four like I want to redeem suffering I want to redeem things that are broken even on our last podcast we talked about strengths and how my number one strength now is restorative it kind of just came out of nowhere to me I didn't really expect to see that at the top of my list but This whole notion that broken things can be repaired and maybe they're not going to be the same, but there can be redemption, there can be healing, there can be growth. And so maybe that friendship will never be, will never be again, but at the very least, I can say with certainty that I've learned a thing or two or three from that friendship and that that can be applied. And who's to say that other friendships haven't been restored or saved because of what I learned in this one friendship that failed. So that's what I'm choosing to hold on to and hope for as I navigate these, especially these same-sex relationships, relationships with other men. All right, so to tie a bow on this conversation on change, I thought it would be fitting and appropriate as people of faith, people who follow Jesus, to talk about maybe our more drastic moments of change in our spirituality. And that can look like lots of things. It can look like a loss of faith. It can look like doubting. It can look like just a really tragic or hard event that maybe threw our faith off kilter for a little bit, or we didn't know what we believed anymore. But, um, or then, and that's obviously from the negative side, positive side, you know, we talk about in Christianese, all these mountaintop moments and things where Jesus seemed more real or more evident. Um, I'm curious, yeah, times in y'all's lives where your spirituality took a change for the better and for the worse. 
Yeah, so for me, I'll start with a really challenging, and I think in some aspects I would I would call it actually bad change, um, is, you know, so in college, I was involved in, um, in a Christian community in college and had a lot of really close friends, and we had a lot of fun together, and, you know, we were all living in the student housing under one roof, and just had this great, um, great community, sweet, sweet times together, um, and then moving out of that into kind of like the cold, harsh, real world, uh, and, and having those people start to kind of migrate to, um, nuclear family suburbia was really hard and finding that I had to fight a lot more for a lot less, um, in terms of finding community and finding people who, um, who I could build build aspects of my life with um, was really was really challenging and 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 I would even like I said I'd even call that like a bad thing because I think that um, that the church our Christian community is not meant to be laid out in um, along the same lines as nuclear family suburbia you know I think God's vision for us is in a lot of ways a lot closer to what um, what those of us who, who end up going to college experience there, you know, if you have a tight knit community, um, Christian community where, where you get to experience, um, just very intentional, uh, love for one another and, and, and pursuing Jesus together. So that's, that's the one side, um, in terms of like a really positive, good change that happened in my life. Um, I remember, one time a few years back, I want to say it was 2013 maybe, or 2014, I was on vacation with my parents and a close friend of mine had just given me word that, um, that they were moving to, um, to Florida to get in, to go to med school. Um, and I was kind of bent out of shape about that or, you know, sad about that. And I didn't know how to handle it and I was praying about it and I think God gave me a lot more than what I was asking for in terms of like comfort um it was a much bigger shift in perspective where as I prayed and as I thought about if God were here what would he say to me um like I I started to realize that God is here and he delights in me and that he um doesn't just love me he likes me um that you know he is excited for me to wake up in the morning, um, that he longs to hold me in his arms, that he is in a certain sense holding me in his arms. Um, you know, I, it occurred to me that the gospel is a lot more personal, a lot more, a lot more exciting, personally exciting, I guess, relationally exciting than, um, than I had previously realized, you know, God couldn't stand the thought of eternity without me. And so he sent his son to die on the cross and rise again to, um, to make it possible for me to be reconciled to him. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I guess in that, like very kind of suddenly almost feeling connected to how much God delights in me, really changed my walk with him so much. Um, changed everything about prayer. Um, I think it's still changing things about reading the Bible. <laughs> That's a, a journey for me. Um, but yeah, it helped me to trust him a lot more. Um, it made, like I said, prayer, it made prayer a lot more appealing and exciting. And I love praying now. Um, and it made, I think it made loving other people and caring for them uh, a lot more exciting too because... Um, because God feels this way about me and I can, um, and I can offer some of that to other people. And when I look at them, I can realize how God feels about them as well Mm -hmm. and act on that. That's amazing, Ryan, to make that shift of like the, the concept of God loving you to Mm -hmm. liking you like that Mm -hmm. is such a huge one. It doesn't seem like on paper, that doesn't seem like a huge shift to make from love to like, but it changes everything when you think about it, like love in some contexts, love can feel so generalized and so surfacey. But to get to to get to the heart of like, do you actually like me? Am I palatable? Am I delightful to you? Am I beautiful to mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. That's a huge 
shift to make, mm-hmm. huge jump to make. And yeah, thanks for sharing that that part of your journey. I resonate with that. Man, for me, this one's hard because, <laughs> like, uh, this spiritual journey has been so wild and crazy. I feel like, oh man, and also the other thing is like, there's hard. It's hard for me to, like, you talk about a good change. And it's hard for me to think of any change that I would call better than the moment I came to know Christ, um, which sounds like a cop out. And I've been trying to figure out something <laughs> else, but like that, I just keep coming back to that. Because talking about a change for the better, I mean, in that moment, I went from a life without God, uh, facing an eternity without Him, to being redeemed, having His righteousness. righteousness placed on me and being having then the the liberty and the freedom to do the things that please him not so I could feel better about myself but so I could truly obey him Mm. and it's hard for me to think about any other change spiritually that's better than that because none of those other changes would have ever happened without that one yeah when was that for you that was right when I went into college. So I came home over Labor Day weekend. Um, was supposed to meet up with some friends at a nearby park, and they were all running late, so I was there by myself. And I was in the, I had been in, in depression for months and months at that point, and I was reading through the scriptures, and um, I was doing the very scientific method of flipping through randomly and putting my finger on a verse and hoping that it would speak to me. And of course, that wasn't working out too well. <laughs> I love that strategy. It's a great strategy. <laughs> it never works, of. but I yeah. love it. <laughs> um, the only thing that happened was I finally ended up in, through doing that, I did end up at Jeremiah 8, which talks about uh, Judah's rebellion against God because they didn't have a relationship with him. And I remember being so angry because I, I was like, God, that's not me. I have a relationship with you. You know, these people, they, they just served you and did what, did all, said and did the right things, uh, but never actually knew you, and God convicted me in that moment that that's what I had been doing with my whole life, that I had been doing, saying, doing, and trying to look the right part without ever considering that I couldn't earn my salvation that way. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the biggest change, period. Everything else, they... The mountaintops and the valleys, that's when they were created, honestly. And so no mountaintop will ever be higher than that moment, but no valley will ever be lower than the moment before then when, um, I mean, I've, told, I've mentioned this to people before, but if I hadn't become saved that night, I would have killed myself because I was all right on the precipice of actually committing suicide. Mm. And the scriptures was like the last ditch effort where if nothing is here, then there's nothing for me ever. And so that moment was the lowest low spiritually. I was probably as as dead spiritually as I could get in that moment. And it was in that time that God brought me to him and I accepted Christ as my savior. And that shot me up to the highest high. And so, yeah, I'm going to do the cop out and say, (laughs) <laughs> that's for both the worst and the no, best that's perfect yeah for what me. an amazing story thanks for being bold to share that I'm sure plenty of people can can resonate with that feeling of hopelessness reaching that last that last ditch effort moment for me um i don't know why i don't know if it is for you guys too spirituality seems like it's oftentimes tied with my relationships my community um mm-hmm. i uh yeah, maybe that's not healthy all the time, but I feel like I actually have been on a journey lately the last few months of separating like, okay, my relationship with Jesus is not one with my relationship with other people. Like if all of my, all my friends and family forsake me, that doesn't mean Jesus is forsaking me and vice versa. And so like, I am on a journey lately of actually learning to have a relationship with Jesus, not necessarily dependent upon my relationship with his church, um, which has oftentimes been strained, but but I will say, yeah, my probably my highest high spiritually slash relationally um, was becoming integrated with a church for the first time when I lived in California for a few years and, you know, visited, gosh, probably 15, 20 churches and just, I didn't know what I was looking for. I knew what I believed. And so like, that's a basic template for finding a church, I guess. But 
but finding like the right personality and the right mix of people and the right vibe and the you know just everything just it always felt so hopeless and so maybe I was just too much of a perfectionist and had this idea of what I wanted in a church and how I wanted to connect with with other believers and other people especially other men of faith but uh, yeah, it just happened to where I had a last ditch moment where I was like, I'm going to visit one more church and that this is going to be it. If it's not this one, then it's just not, I'm just not going to go to church anymore. Like, it's just too hard to not only find a place that feels right, but then to get integrated and to find people and community within the church. It was just so hard for this like socially anxious introvert like me. Um, and then lo and behold, I like had that last ditch moment where I was going to visit one more church and this was the one and I, I went there and I actually really enjoyed it and it went really well and I visited a, uh, this church had some satellite campuses so then I visited a satellite campus that was closer to home and actually loved that one even more um, and got to visit that one and tried out a group and it took a while to get integrated with the group but I stuck with it and the, the people of that group stuck with me and they were always excited to see me and asked about my life and and lo and behold, there was a baptism service one night at this church. And baptisms up until that point for me, like I've been I've been a Christ follower ever since I was a kid, but never got baptized. I always saw it as this like religious exercise. And it was always scary because like, especially when I moved as a kid to a mega church, there was just like such an impersonal element of like getting up in front of everybody. These people don't even know who you are and you're like going underwater and it's just so dramatic. And I just didn't want any part of that. And I just wanted it to be right for me. Like I, I, I thought it was a good thing to do to get baptized, but like, I didn't want to just do it to do it. I wanted to do it because I felt like God was actually calling me to do it at the right time, at the right place. And so that, that was an idea that's been tabled and that had been tabled in my heart for years and years and years. And when I saw this particular baptism service where, like, we all went outside and there was these inflatable tubs out there and, like, people rallying around them and circling around them and, and sharing their stories. It was very personal. It was very story-driven. And, and then everyone cheering and praying. And, like, it was just a really beautiful sight for me to behold. And, and like, this was already a few months after going to this church and getting integrated with a small group. And, and that idea, that seed was planted like Tom you should probably get baptized. Like you should probably take that step, take that jump. Like, I think this is the, the time and the place to do it. And I brought that up one night at this small group and everyone was so excited for me. We were meeting in someone's living room at the time. And the person whose living room it was just got up right then and was like, we could do it right now. We could go in the bathtub and we could (laughs) baptize you right now. And I was like, no, no, I think I want to like, I want my parents to be there. And, you know, I had this like vision of what I wanted to happen. And And so then I think it was maybe two months later that we coordinated it where my parents could come all the way from Georgia to California and my roommates at the time were there, my church group was there and actually this friend that I mentioned um, earlier in this podcast, he was there and so it was really cool to see all these different spheres of my life intersected in this moment where I got baptized and I blogged about it and and talked about it online, wrote about it in my my book um, and just had this really... I don't know, it was like a weight lifted where it was like God kind of, God reminded me, you know, that he hadn't given up on me and that he, he did have plans to, to further my journey. And I wasn't meant to just live in isolation the rest of my life and, and that he does want me to be surrounded by like-minded people who are following madly after him. And I found that in this church. And ever since that moment, yeah, I've just been, you know, communities have changed and I've moved multiple times and geographies have changed, seasons of life have changed for other people. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't think I ever have to go to bed wondering, like, am I ever going to find my people? Am I ever going to be alone? And that translates really well with your other brothers and all the men and all the amazing people of faith that I've met in this community. um, We might be separated oftentimes geographically, but I know that I have this like common bond with these people. Um, not just on a emotional level or, you know, common struggles or common sexualities, but like the most important thing is a common spirituality. Like I know I have brothers in faith, um, spiritual brothers that I'll have the rest of my life. And I'm so grateful for them. And I'm grateful for, for that change, that baptism that really showed that, you know, community following after Jesus with other people is not just a concept. It's something that happens. And I'm so grateful to, to take part in that with, with you guys in this hot closet and <laughs> everyone else in this house and everyone else connected through Yob and through, um, through this little world that that's come about. 
Yeah, Tom, I love that. And and you know this is the drum I'm always beating is that um that we we were created to be uh, to be a part of the church, that we belong in the church, that there's a church out there that you need. There's also a church out there that needs you. And so mm-hmm. I'm really thankful that um that you kind of came to that in your journey where it is worth the risk, it is worth the time, it is worth the disappointment and frustration sometimes to um to pursue that and to plug yourself in there. Many years ago, when my life was stale and I was trying to figure out where to go, physically, literally, and metaphorically, spiritually, I was still living at my parents' house at 23 years old, had a college degree, had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, working in retail and absolutely miserable, beyond a purpose, beyond a job, just not having community, a reason to really wake up in the morning. And I read a book by Donald Miller, his first book that he ever wrote called Through Painted Deserts. And the author's note alone convicted me that a change needed to happen, that I needed to go, that I needed to leave. And ultimately reading this book set me on a course of leaving and of change that I've never turned back from. In talking about his own life in Texas, seeing the horizon of a new life ahead, Miller says this, I could not have known then that everybody, every person, has to leave, has to change like seasons. They have to, or they die. The seasons remind me that I must keep changing, and I want to change because it is God's way. All my life I have been changing, I changed from a baby to a child, from soft toys to play daggers. I changed into a teenager to drive a car, into a worker to spend some money. I will change into a husband to love a woman, into a father to love a child. Change houses so we are near water, and again so we are near mountains, and again so we are near friends. Keep changing with my wife, getting our love so it dies and gets born again and again like a garden fed by four seasons, a cycle of change. Everybody has to change or they expire. Everybody has to leave. Everybody has to leave their home and come back so they can love it again for all new reasons. I want to keep my soul fertile for the changes so things keep getting born in me, so things keep dying when it is time for things to die. I want to keep walking away from the person I was a moment ago because a mind was made to figure things out, not to read the same page recurrently. Only the good stories have the characters different at the end than they were at the beginning. And the closest thing I can liken life to is a book, the way it stretches out on paper, page after page, as if to trick the mind into thinking it isn't all happening at once. Time has pressed you and me into a book too, this tiny chapter we share together, this vapor of a scene, pulling our seconds into minutes and minutes into hours. Everything we were is no more, and what we will become will become what was. It might be time for you to go, It might be time to change. And so, my brothers, let us learn to change well, because it is God's way, a way of endings and beginnings, a way of tears and calm, a way of death and resurrection. Let us learn to embrace the seasons God has purposefully sculpted into our stories, the budding springs, blissful summers, bountiful autumns, and bitter winters. May we trust him to provide our daily bread in times of harvest, sustaining us also in tides of famine, when our bonds with others bruise or break, when our faith feels frail, when we cannot see beyond this tear-stained page. In times of change, may we lean into our Lord all the more, believing his ways are good, his ways are best, even when his ways and his seasons of change devastate us. Let us always remember God's provision in the past as we step forward with a tremble, believing wholeheartedly that change is not just for bitter burials, taking heart that change, God's change, is meant to birth wonders anew. All right, y'all. So that's it. We changed. How do y'all feel? (laughs) I feel like a new person. A new man that will soon be birthed out of this closet. I feel very warm. Yeah. I'm really excited to experience the change of temperature. 
going out of this closet soon. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We, we suffer for the people, though. We we mm-hmm. go to hot closets to get good sound quality, and then we go back in the world. In this That's closet, what we're to do. the interior is wooden boards, and mm-hmm. it's getting hot, so it really looks and feels like a sauna now. Like a sweat lodge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I do like saunas, so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I'll just stay in here for a little you bit. You could, by all means, stay in the closet. <laughs> you do that, Brian. <laughs> You I will stay in the closet. Dean and I will go to the air conditioned house that <laughs> exists outside of this. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode, this episode on change. I would love to hear from you guys. Go to yourotherbrothers.com slash podcast, find the episode 40 post on change and tell us a story. I would love to hear. I'm really intrigued by this whole before and after moment in people's lives, a, a part one and a part two uh, before this happened and then after this happened. So I'd be curious if you would be so bold if you could share some of your life-changing moments of before and after, and then throw in some spiritual, emotional, relational changes. How have you grown? How have you learned? And how have some other things maybe not turned out so well in the changes, the ebbs and flows of your life? Uh, Tell us a story or two. We love those. So we've been doing two episodes a month for a really long time. That's been kind of our, our standard ever since we hit a certain level on Patreon. And I'm committed to continuing that rhythm to podcasts a month. However, what it will be now moving forward, at least for right now, it's an experiment. This is all an experiment. Uh, We will do one public podcast a month. Mm. So that'll be just like what you're hearing right now. We'll do one of these every single month. And then we will also do one bonus podcast per month for our Patreon supporters only. And so if you're a Patreon supporter, you're going to continue to get two podcasts a month, just as you've been hearing. This bonus podcast, I envision something where it's going to be hopefully a little more interactive. That's my goal. Because starting now, you, dear listener, can call the Your Other Brothers podcast and leave us a message with your voice. And we can talk about you and your story and your questions on this bonus Yaversation podcast that we do every oh. single month. So I'm really excited to delve into this, and I'm hoping that people <laughs> will respond, because we have we clearly have listeners. It's not like we're just talking in a closet to two people right now. Like We clearly have hundreds of listeners, which is encouraging. That's really encouraging. Um, but I also recognize that issues like this maybe are more... Um, they're easier to talk about via email or via comment. But I know we also have a lot of outgoing people and people who don't mind putting their voice to things. And and um, you certainly don't need to tell your name or any kind of identifying details on these messages if you don't want to. I mean, you certainly can. Um, but it's kind of this new dimension for the podcast that eventually maybe this will carry over into the public podcast that we do each month. But for now, these messages will only be read or played um, on the bonus podcast every month. And so if you want to ask a question, this is like groundbreaking first time doing this, so it's gonna, we're going to learn as we go. But if you have a question for me or for any of the other brothers, um, you can call us now and leave us a message and we can play your question if it's good. I mean, it's got to be like entertaining, insightful, worth playing on the air. Um, but if you want to, you can call our number. And I'm really disappointed because it's just a generic phone number. Like I really wanted a, uh, (laughs) one of those like vanity numbers, like 1-800 brothers or something (laughs) for, for your other brother's podcast or like SSA LGBT or something. (laughs) That's seven characters, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not one of those. So it's a generic number, but y'all can call anytime, leave a message and who knows, maybe we'll play it on the air, answer it. If you have a story to share, you can share it Um, But you can call this number, 706-389-8009. Call us anytime. Leave a message. Be pithy. Be, like, concise. Don't tell us a 30-minute story, because that's obviously not playable on a 30-minute podcast. But if you have a question for your other brothers, for the podcast, for the blog, for an author in particular, um, shoot it our way. And who knows? Maybe we'll play it and have some fun with that, because I would love to see this podcast become more interactive than it's already been. People already comment great stories on our blog, on our podcast pages, but I'd love to hear audible voices and maybe, yeah, add that dynamic to the show as well. So I'm really excited. I hope that that goes well. Ryan and Dean, feel free to call the number. You guys can ask questions too. Sweet. (laughs) Sounds good. You're going to be hearing from me, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, you can hear. You can call anytime. I'd love to hear from you. I was gonna say, is there a limit to the number of times I can call? <laughs> As of now, no. We might need to adapt adopt that standard rates that. apply. <laughs> yeah, standard, yeah, I should say that for our international callers. Yes, yeah, standard rates will apply. Thanks for Change Machines for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Because if you do have a gigantic nasty bowl of pennies from the 18th century you can spend them now you can now put it in a machine that will turn it into cash or like a target gift card or something Mm -hmm. or you can send it to patreon you uh, could you could create a patreon jar bowl like i'm going to for my 12 cents that i accumulate every three months and it'll go somewhere it'll do something it'll do some good Actually, this just in, uh, we've developed a new partnership with Change Machines where if you send your change to a special P.O. box that, oh. uh, that you'll, you'll hear in a little bit, uh, we will convert your change into um, podcasts. So please send your change and live bunnies <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna like I always get so sad when I open our P.O. box and I see nothing there but now I'm just gonna be more sad if I just open it up and someone sent an envelope with four cents <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for those pennies they'll be put to good use but I guess better pennies than bunnies please don't send me your live bunnies I do not want them thank you Ryan thank you Dean appreciate y'all thank you joining me thank in the you. closet today and um, yeah stay tuned for our first y'all conversation question mark episode that'll be coming up in a couple weeks here at your other brothers so that's all for episode 40 this is tom this is ryan and this is dean hugs and kisses for all your other brothers don't forget you are not alone even the sparrow finds a home see you next time everybody bye bye <laughs> <Good Bye. bye. laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Your Other Brothers Podcast. Navigate more with us at yourotherbrothers.com and comment on this episode at yourotherbrothers.com slash podcast. Subscribe to our show to never miss an episode. And if you enjoy what we do, consider rating and reviewing us on iTunes. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Your Other Bros. If you'd like to further support our storytelling effort, consider becoming a yobber. Yobbers pledge monthly and receive perks like calls with authors and other supporters, access to a secret Facebook group, and additional podcast content. Visit patreon.com slash your other bros for more information. Don't miss our monthly bonus podcast on Patreon, The Yabalog, featuring responses to previous podcasts, content not featured in public episodes, calls from listeners, and more. Ask us a question or tell us a story by leaving us a message at 706-389-8009. If you're new to the show, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at podcast at yourotherbrothers.com. You can also write us at Your Other Brothers, P.O. Box 843, Asheville, North Carolina, 28802. Until we journey next time, we're glad you're with us.